The question is, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? For me, the principle that we work best when we work together. Well, they didn't. Very serious. The referendum. It seems to me that they're not dealing with the issues. Hello, this is Scottish Independence Podcast number 78, and I've just got away from the soil and the blood and whatnot to record this introduction. And this episode is with writer Karen Campbell, who is a crime novelist and has a unique perspective on those novels because she was also a policeman for a long time. And this is an episode that I'm sure is not going to disappoint you. Because apart from writing the novels, Karen's been very active on the Yes circuit recently and making lots of speeches that a lot of people have had a lot of good things to say about. So uh, we'll just go straight to the conversation or have a wee word with you at the end. Hi, Karen. How's it going? Hi, Michael. I'm well. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. A bit busy at the moment. So it's a hectic time of year for me. And this is the second one of these I've recorded this morning. The other one was with uh, someone you're going to be travelling with very shortly, which is Corrine Polwer. Um, you're going to be travelling on this bus party. Um, are you looking forward to that? Yeah, very much. I, I think I'm doing the autumn one. But I think there's one in May and then there's going to be another one in autumn. So I don't know if Karen and I will be on at the same time. But yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to get involved in that, especially when it's coming down. I live in Galloway now, although I'm from Glasgow, and there's not an awful lot of activities happening down here in terms of the referendum. So they're paying us a visit, which will be great. Yeah, the bus party seems to be going to some of the places a little further out of the way than um, where most people tend to get to. Absolutely, and I think that's really, really important for debate and for just getting the spark, you know, spreading everywhere so that it doesn't feel that it's just a central belt issue. And, it, you know, and since I've moved down to the, the countryside, it's amazing how, how your attitude shifts and you think, you know, we are forgotten about here. We're not mentioning the weather. We're not... Just, just all the sort of things about transport and infrastructure and that you, you feel you're out in the kind of middle of nowhere. And I can understand maybe why places like some of the islands or, or down in the borders, you feel a bit more disengaged perhaps because sometimes you don't hear any different voices and you don't, you just feel that it, the argument's not coming to you. Uh, yeah, so it's important to involve all these communities. But um, we had on someone from Yes Borders recently, uh, Ash, Ash Regan Denham as well. So I, I know that there are some events down there. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, the borders is a big place, and I'm in Galloway, so that's the southwest, and the borders are more the sort of east coast. Um, I mean, there's things starting to happen here. We're getting a, a national collective set up in, in D&G, which is good, but it, it's taken quite a long time for it to sort of drip down here, so I think in the run-up to the referendum, it's really important that as many different opportunities for different voices to be heard happen everywhere in Scotland. Yeah, just to come to that idea about different voices, because um, I read your article on Bella Caledonia a while back. I thought it was an excellent article. And the main thing that really struck me was that you said that all of this comes down to the fact of, are we a discrete, distinctive nation that deserves autonomy? In other words, should we be speaking with our own voice uh, or not through the lens of the media? And what you wrote after that was quite strong. Um, Would you like to explain to the listeners? Yeah, it came in the back of me going to um, it's one of the, the Brian Taylor uh, big debates on the radio and, and they actually had it in Dumfries, so there's me saying nothing ever happens here, and it did, but anyway it was the only thing, we'd <laughs> gone along and you know, he, he began by saying like, let's talk about the whole debate as if you're um, talking you know, to your friends, it's not about grandstanding, it's not about politics, it's about just the way you would speak ordinarily and let's get away from all the sort of minutiae of, of you know, the pound and the Europe and trying to just just talk more honestly, but very quickly it got back into this, you know, well, I need a passport to go to the shops in Carlisle, that sort of, of debate. And when I was going home, I thought, you know, we keep saying this isn't about identity, and it's not about identity in the sense of, you know, how much Scottish blood you've got in your veins or how many times you've watched Braveheart or any of that rubbish. And to be honest, I think the only people that do cite this sort of Misty Hills type identity are, are the, the no camp. But it did strike me that it is about, when you say things like, I'm a proud Scot, you've really got to say, what is it I'm proud of? Are you proud of Scotland as a country, as a nation, as, as everyone else understands a country to be in the whole world? Or are you proud of it as, as a sort of junior region of the UK? Because I cannot understand how, if you're proud of Scotland and you believe that devolution is good and you believe that, you know, we, we have got different problems, different economies, different issues. 
different cultural considerations that means we need Holyrood to, to look at these. And I think most people will feel it has been a success having Holyrood, whether you were against evolution to start. So if, if you feel all of that is good because we are different and we are separate and we have something that is distinct and, and you know discreet in that sense of, of we're a unit, how does it not follow then that, that we should take responsibility for all our decisions? How does it mean that we're a kind of half country, if you know what I mean, that we're allowed to take responsibility for some things, but not others? And, and that's what makes me struggle when people say they're a proud Scot, but, and they start supporting the, the no side. What they're really saying is, um, I'm proud of, I don't know, the, the bit of Scotland that I support at rugby or the bit of Scotland that I put on my kilt to go grouse shooting. But everyone else in the world, when they say they're, they're proud of their country, there's kind of no argument about that. You know what it is, you know what your country stands for. And it doesn't mean that you're against other countries. It just means you're confident that you are a, a whole unit, that your, your power is held with your people and, and that those people don't have to start an argument with someone else when they, they even talk about the audacity of, of making their own decisions. And that's the kind of thing I was trying to probably more articulately say um, on, on paper um, or on words with, with Bella, because that's why I'm a writer, I'm not a talker. But it's this, oh, don't worry, but it's um, it's kind of a strange, there's two separate narratives because um, that was what made, what you're saying there is what made George Robertson's comments so extraordinary. To say, I'm a proud Scot, but we don't have culture, we don't have language, and we've got none of that sort of stuff. So if you're a proud Scot, exactly as you asked in the article, what is, he, what is George Robertson proud of if we don't have culture and language and everything separate? It's a bizarre position to take. It actually makes no, when you take every emotion stripped out, it makes no logical sense that you can recognise you live in a place called Scotland. You recognise it's separate in terms of it, it has so many different social and cultural structures that are separate and have made, you know, stayed separate uh, throughout the Union in some cases. And it's not about separation, I don't want to use that word, but it's about the fact that these things are already, they just are. We're not, we're not creating the notion of a Scot out of thin air. Scotland has always been and will continue to be, no matter what the outcome of this, this vote is, and, and that's fine. But my point was that if, if you recognise those differences, are you really just saying, but we're a bit like Yorkshire in that we do nice puddings or something? You know, it, where do you where do you decide a, a, a nation begins and a region ends? And I, I just feel if we vote no, we are saying, yeah, we're a region of the United Kingdom. We're not actually a country at all. And everything that being a country entails, which includes making your own mistakes. And I think that would be a really healthy thing for Scotland. No longer to be able to say, ah, see if it wasn't for that lockdown in, in Westminster. You know, it, it does nobody any favours to have that kind of apologetic existence, which is kind of how I feel Scotland does at the moment. It's, it's sometimes quite depressing as well. But um, on the cultural level, there's this kind of debate. But a lot of the official debate has been very much on the technocratic uh, side of it. I mean, how do you feel the whole thing's going? First, we'll look at the official campaigns and then maybe look at the, the more sort of grassroots campaigns or astroturf campaigns, if you prefer, maybe <laughs> on one side. But, I mean, on the level of the official yes campaign, how do you feel they're doing? I think... It feels to me, and I suppose it's difficult because when you do favour one side against the other, you of course you look for the positives on that side and you, you suck up information about that side and you tend to deride or ignore um, you know, positives from the other side. But it seems to me that it is true in terms of a grassroots movement. It, it, it's, there's an excitement that I don't remember since I was at university in terms of, of politics and people actually coming together and wanting to talk and going out to town halls on a wet Friday night and and speaking about who they are and what they want. And I find that really, if nothing else, no matter what way the vote goes, I would hate for all of that, that care about your society to disappear at the end of it. Um, and I do feel, obviously I'm biased, but I feel the Yes campaign have been much more instrumental in that than, than the No campaign, which seems to have been pretty much top down and they're kind of changing who their heads are all the time, apparently. Um, Darling is out and Douglas Alexander is in, according to the papers today, and you know they're bringing in the, the big guns. and That in itself, those actions feel more dictatorial, don't they? Somehow it's like, yeah. here's some other important folk to tell you what to think. And the Yes campaign, you know, I've, I've spoken at some meetings and you, you've just got ordinary folk sitting there and, and some of the questions, you, you, you know, 
think, well, that's been discussed ages ago, but it's important to them to talk about. And that is what politics to me should be about. I mean, you know, I, I would hope if we do go for yes, then we'll get a chance to really change politics in terms of much more local democracy than, than we have at the moment. But, you know, that that's that's for the future. But it, it just feels that people are, are, are having to give themselves a shake, I think, and actually look at the things we've all just taken for granted or kind of never really thought about at all. And that has got to be healthy. Yeah, there's been a reinvigoration all around the country. So you said you've spoken at a few of these meetings. How do you feel they go, the, the reaction that you get there? It wasn't rabble-rousing. It wasn't flag waving it was just people being honest and there wasn't any confrontation now that might be because there was no better together people there but there's been that many meetings cancelled across scotland because better together are refusing to put up folk to come and, and talk you know to share a platform with with them um, people that are on the yes side which is not good and also strikes me as as being again this you know we know what's best for you you don't actually need to talk about it at all but i i mean i was nervous beforehand because you know, it's one thing to talk about your work or your books or whatever, but you're basically talking about yourself and what you feel. And, and of course, that could be contentious. But um, afterwards, I thought, no, I'd like to do that again, actually. It, was, it, it felt in some small, tiny way that I'd, I'd got to say my piece. Um, and, you know, and I definitely come from the sort of background, like when I was younger, you know, like you never ask your mum and dad how they voted or anything. It's, it's, your politics is personal and it's quiet and you don't shove it down people's throats. But I think more and more people that I talk to, you're being asked to have your say, and that in itself. How how often do politicians or, or you know commentators on television ask ordinary folk what they think about everything, pretty much? And that's happening, and people are listening, and you know argument and debate is sparking other argument and debate. So it just felt that I I wanted to throw my, my hat in the ring, and I would hate to look back um, on this period and, and think I. I sort of watch from the sidelines. I'm not suggesting that any one person can change anyone's views, but it, it feels like a participatory, you know, campaign on the yes side. And and so even if it's just going out and putting leaflets through doors or wearing a badge, even mm-hmm. you know, wearing a yes badge. I mean, I had an exchange at my my local market with a, another person. It was it was a bit like sort of your lapel twitches and you like you reveal it, you know, the the, the yes badge yeah. behind, and they do the same. And <laughs> you know, there was this sort of knowing smile. But that in itself, I'm thinking. I feel that the Yes campaign certainly doesn't get the press coverage that the, the, the Better Together side have been having. And so anything people can do ordinarily that just normalises the Yes perspective, it doesn't make it something that's only, you know, the odd sort of rampant nationalist that, that feels, you know, even just something like having a Yes sticker in your car, it's almost creating that environment that, well, of course this is a logical argument and of course lots of people feel this and, you know, it's not something to to only talk about in sort of smoky pubs or whatever. Um, so I think it's brilliant. I, I think it's it really reminds me of my student days when you kind of wanted to, you know, you had that enthusiasm for the world that you thought maybe yeah. we can make a difference. And God, can you imagine if, if we can make a difference again in terms of just, I don't know, it worries me that, you know, it feels like a wave is cresting. And then after the, the September the 18th, there's going to be an awful lot of people that are deflated, whichever way the vote goes. and. I don't think anyone should be triumphalist about which which way um, we end up jumping, but I do think people need to think long and hard about what the aftermath will be as well. Things need to be done with a fair amount of tact and subtlety, I think. But to come to your capacity as a writer, um, because I, I, I just wanted to ask you, do you think there's a book in... After after the dust has all settled and things have calmed down, do you think there's a book in NDREF? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of who's the obvious heroes and villains and caricatures. Or, but with the grassroots side of the Yes campaign, it seems that there's not going to main hero or villain. Yeah, I, I think there'll be hundreds of roots in this. I mean, I've just finished a novel and it is about the run-up to the referendum. I think if you're a contemporary writer and you're living in Scotland, it's very hard to ignore the fact that this campaign is, is basically seeping into every aspect of, of life. And it's, you know, it's becoming quite a... A populist thing now, and it's it's not it's for everybody. So, I mean, the, the sort of thrust of my book was whether again which way the vote goes. This is just such a fascinating time to when individuals and a nation as a whole are being asked to really look closely at themselves and say, look, who am I, and what do I want for the future, and what kind of do I want my legacy to be. So, I think if you're creative at all, then 
there's so much rich pickings there that you know and already you're seeing a lot you, you've got various plays and poetry and you know that there's a sort of wellspring of people are excited by it I'm just hoping um, the twist at the end is a positive one that's all in, in my book uh, no no uh, in, the, for, <laughs> in, the, in the independence referendum itself uh, well yeah Another thing about yourself is that you worked as a, a police officer for uh, a number of years. And um, something that I think is an interesting area, although it's a delicate area, is that there's a lot of people undecided, people that might be natural yes voters, but are involved in uh, various football groups. And there's there's a great resentment around the country at the moment among football supporters in general, not just one team, of many, many teams, about the, the current treatment that, that, that they're given. You know, it's not a family day out. You're treated, you're treated like cattle. You're herded on and off the train, and everyone is kind of presumed guilty. Uh, I know it might be a, a delicate area for you, but, I mean, how do you feel about this? Do you, um, the policing of football, um, particularly, and policing in general in Scotland? I don't know if that's an issue that should affect the independence referendum one way or the other because it, it, it seems to be one very specific um, you know strand of, of what our society is about but I mean if I'm being honest I'm uncomfortable with the fact that there's a single police force now I thought from the very first time that was mooted it was not a good idea you're, you're taking away again local accountability where you used to have um, seven or eight forces who, who each were responsible to their own board of you know councillors at the local authority level that's all gone now um, you don't have local joint boards, um, you don't have seven or eight different chief constables all able to argue as equals about the way ahead for policing and make their own autonomous decisions locally. So that is all gone and now you have one chief constable, you have one force, you have one size fits all policing for everywhere. Um, and that is leading to an awful lot of uncomfortable situations, um, yeah, with things like football matches, with things like how... Um, Brothels, you know, in Edinburgh were being policed as opposed to in, in Glasgow where there was very different views on tolerance zones and, and, you know, turning a blind eye as opposed to prosecuting. But but these things have all been now treated the same way and, and cops are getting less autonomy themselves, which I think is a very bad thing. Um, this is this is all not in favour of independence, but, I, you know, it's not against it either. It's just mm -hmm. the one aspect of, of our structures, if you like, are going. And I would hope that um, with a yes vote, we can look more again about local accountability and about really power being held at a, a less centralised level. But in terms of, of the, the policing of football matches, I think that was down to the sectarian legislation that came in, wasn't it? Yeah. Where, and again, I mean, all, all of my books about the police kind of explored that over a maybe 10, 12 year period of, of how the more we see our liberties are under threat, whether it's through terrorism or sectarianism or whatever, and the way we try and legislate as opposed to use existing powers and use existing common sense and use consent instead of force, actually you create more problems and you take away liberties even more. So, yeah, I can understand where, where those football fans are coming from, but I, I would just say, well, that isn't what I feel our Scotland should be like. And I don't think that's a reason to ever consider how you would vote yes or no in, in a you know a referendum that's that's about the future of Scotland for the next however many hundreds of years. Yeah, like because um, in some ways the the picture is worse down in England. Um, if you talk about the Blair government and how many uh, civil liberties were taken away by them, and then you look at the the current discussion uh, going on around immigration, which uh, in England in the poll seems to have overtaken overtaken the economy as what people say is the. Um, the most important issue, and I believe you've got a book out, uh, the difficulties of an asylum seeker coming coming to to this country. How do you feel an independent Scotland could be treating those people better than what currently seems the the situation in the United Kingdom, where and even the Scottish government's not able to do something about something as horrible as Dungavel? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. It is the classic, uh, we would do this, but for Westminster, our hands are tied. But it is true that, that it's not a devolved responsibility. Asylum and, and refugee and immigration as a whole, none of that is, is, is devolved to Scotland. So you have this real difficulty where you've got you know, a, a set of beliefs that are fundamentally different to um, those of Westminster. And you've got charities like the Scottish Refugee Council who work incredibly hard with less and less funding, which again comes centrally from Westminster in the main, from the Home Office, 
trying to tell people that they're safe, trying to tell people that they'll be believed, that they'll be listened to. I'm, I'm talking about refugees and asylum seekers here. And then you, you have the UK border agency who can ultimately come and, you know, you've heard about John Ray's and things in, in, mm-hmm. in the press where families are just um, weaked away basically and, and told, no, we don't believe you, you're going back home. So you've got this real conflict over, you actually had, you know, those posters about um, go home, um, if you remember, that were circulating down in, in London. Yeah, and there was the, the, the vans. That, that came to Glasgow as well, and I think they had posters up in Brand Street, um, which was the, the UK border agency office in Glasgow. So people who have got legitimate claims are sitting there seeing those posters and thinking, what, what do people feel about me here? Because you're getting mixed messages. And I know that there's um, you know, discussions about having a separate um, Scottish asylum service if, if, if we have a yes vote. And, and there'll still be, in terms of immigration, of course, there'll still be a, a I think we talked about a point space system. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but you know, in terms of immigration, that will still be controlled in some degree. But for asylum seekers and refugees who are people that are fleeing war, persecution, torture, there's going to be a door rather than a wall. And again, it's about what kind of society we want to live in. Surely all of us, whoever we are and whatever political stripe we are, if we were in that position where we had nothing and we landed like a piece of driftwood in someone else's shore, and then you have to start trying to make people believe your story and then you have to be othered always and, and treated as, as you know, out to scrounge and to lie and to cheat. That's not what we'd wish for ourselves. And, and I, looking at, at, at the white paper, when the discussion of, uh, of asylum and, and refugee status and immigration, I haven't gone into it in great depth, but certainly the white paper seems to have a much more generous spirit about how Scotland would, would manage its own affairs. Yeah, it comes down very often to that old idea about if you want to see how a person really is, you have to see how they treat those less fortunate than them, not those more um, fortunate. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Okay, and um, if we can move on to our last question, which is the question I ask everyone. What was it that made you decide to support independence? Was it a specific incident? Was it a number of things? Have you always felt it was the, the right way to go? Or is it something more recent? I think I would always have been a yes voter. I'm just Scottish, and when I say I'm Scottish, that doesn't mean I'm saying I don't like other types of people. It doesn't mean I'm saying I'm not this. It doesn't mean I'm saying I'm better than that. It just means I'm Scottish, and I've never really, I've never identified with being British, or, or you know, it seems to be a, a much more artificial construct. It, it's, it's a kind of patchwork of different histories, which in itself, that that's I can completely understand where. My passion for Scotland, I can understand people having that passion for Britain, totally. But I think it's more of a nostalgic passion, maybe, than my passion for the future. Uh, it seems to me that the, the Better Together side is about looking to the past and all the things that has been good for Britain. And I look now and I think that things like the NHS and, and you know, the sort of the political system that you might have believed in at one time, none of that seems to be working anymore. It's, it's all broken. So I think I would always have... have been yes if you'd asked me from a teenager onwards but I think the more I have read and the more I have listened to the arguments on both sides and I suppose there's so many words flying about that I've started to look at actions rather than words and I think that's a good way for a lot of people maybe to to go if you think oh I can't I'm suffering from information overload here because everyone's going to say ah you can no you can depending on what side they're on but when you actually start looking at how people are behaving and I think the turning point for a lot of people and and me included in terms of oh no this this is I have to say something here, um, was George Osborne and, and the pound. And you just think, that again summed up to me, OK, we thought we were in a union. We thought we were the country of Scotland united with the country of England. We already had united with Northern Ireland and, and the Principality of Wales. But actually, we're not, we're, not, we're not equal partners in this at all. And that way, I think, Better Together fought this campaign has writ large how very unequal the partnership is and how ultimately... It's all been a bit of smoke and mirrors, and really when it comes down to it, we have very little autonomy, very little say. You know, I think one, was it Labour, that said, we will make sure that um, the right to have Holyrood is enshrined in statute, and I thought, what? You mean it's not already? Things like that, I don't know if people realise that mm-hmm. all, all of that power is, is, is lent to us. It can be tweaked away again, so the, the more arguments that have come out on both sides, the more I think it's, it's held up a very bright light to actually where we are at the moment and, and that 
to me was kind of defining was, was the pound thing, just you're naughty children and, and um, you'll be punished. And I thought, oh, no, I, how are we all going to pretend that we've got a union again if, if it is a noble? Um, it'll be very, very difficult. I mean, what you said there about the partnership of equals, if, you know, um, you said, I can see why people would have that attachment to that, but I, I'd have to put that in a in a conditional <laughs> uh, tense because I could see why people would have that attachment if there had been a, a partnership of equals. But like you say, it's been writ large that there isn't at the moment, and I think it's debatable if, if there ever was. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, but I think it's obvious to people who are, are forensically examining and looking and studying and, and, and researching and being on the right websites. I don't know how obvious it is to ordinary folk that aren't that interested in politics that get their daily paper and read what's in it and think, oh, OK, because a lot of the time politics don't really, I think especially maybe the people that, that politics should affect the most, it really does impact on their lives, kind of either you're you're very content so you don't need to worry or you're very very despondent in which case you feel what's the point nobody listens to me so I think that there's a, a warm maybe not warm nostalgia about the union but there's a sense of safety there's a sense of oh it's fine it's okay and oh, they'll just all talk you know talk amongst each other and politicians talk hot air and and I, I, I wouldn't be too sure that it's it's so obvious to everyone else that actually when when you strip it bare and you hold a sharp light on, on what the union is Honestly, it's not a union. I don't know if it ever was, but it certainly isn't a union now. It feels very imbalanced. And I think the strongest way I, I can feel about, it's a bit negative, the union is, you can't, we can't in Scotland change anything. Tony Benn said once, um, ask not what politicians can do for you, but how can we get rid of you if we don't, we don't like what you're doing? Mm-hmm. We can't do that in Westminster. At least we could with Hollywood. And I know that's a really negative way of looking at it, but if you have to strip it down to that, if, if Hollywood was our only government, our votes, all of us together, we could say, no, we don't like what you're doing, out you get. We've not been able to do that over successive generations with Westminster, and that will continue. And I think that's um, a very good reason and a good note to finish. So uh, uh, thanks for coming on, Karen. That's been, that's been wonderful. Pleasure. So there you go, that was Karen, and I'm sure that didn't disappoint. There'll be another couple of episodes out in the week, and I'm recording for all that with Andrew tomorrow, so we'll have one of those for you as well. The only thing remaining is to say that on this show, the guest chooses a tune, and this is the one that Karen chose, so I'll speak to you next time.
Oh, 